I'm reading A Letter to Mrs. Roosevelt by Coco, C. Coco de Young. I'm going to read chapters one through four. Chapter one. The Shooting Star, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I never used to pay much attention to the dark. Well, except for the nights when I sat on our front porch swing, counting the stars and waiting. I would find a patch of stars caught between the rooftops across the street and swing and count and count and wait. One night, my best friend's mother called to me from her porch next door. Margot, go inside. It's raining. There are no stars for you to count. Thank you, Mrs. Meglio. But I can still see the stars from last night. I called back. I didn't tell her that my eyes were closed tight and I was trying to remember them. Nighttime was my friend back then, keeping me company while I waited for the trolley car to bring Mama and Papa home. I could hear the clatter as it crossed over the first street bridge and turned right onto Maple Avenue. Papa would climb down the steps, then hold out his hand to Mama. I could tell right then if Charlie, he's my little brother, had had a good day or bad. Charlie had been kicked in the knee when he tried to pick up break up a fight between two boys during a game of kickball. He'd convinced Mama and Papa that it was an accident, but I was not so sure. I can remember hearing Charlie groan during the night. I went to check it. I went in to check him, but he was sound asleep. The next morning, Charlie's knee looked like a balloon. He stayed in bed all day. It didn't help. When the doctor visited that evening, he told Papa to get Charlie to the hospital immediately. The infection in Charlie's knee bone was called osteomyelitis. Every day for four months, Mama and Papa rode the trolley to Mercy Hospital to visit Charlie. Every night for four months, I waited for their return. I was seven. The hospital rules posted in the front lobby said I was too young to visit my brother. That's why I stayed home. Although Sister Cecilia did sneak me up to the third floor children's ward to see Charlie one time. It was in January, right after Charlie's accident. He held her, she held her arm out to Mama as if she was guiding her through the halls and hid me between the folds of the long, draping sleeve of her habit. She told me that two things were certain. If we could get past Mother Superior, it would be a miracle. And the best medicine for Charlie was to know how much we all loved him. Charlie was in a big room with other children, some older and some younger than his five years. I remember rushing over to the pillow, covered with the familiar dark brown curls. Charlie, I whispered, I've come to take you home. I would help Mama and Papa take care of Charlie. Charlie opened his eyes and my heart sank at the same time. He looked all swallowed up in the big hospital bed with sides like a crib. I knew then that it would be a long time before Charlie would play caddy with me and my best friend, Rosa. I just knew I would have to wait to play anything with Charlie, and I did. Nobody ever told me why Sister Cecilia snuck me up to his room, but I think they were afraid Charlie would die. He was sick, really sick. The doctor operated on Charlie's knee, but the infection spread further down. The doctor wanted to amputate Charlie's leg above the knee. Papa told the doctor he would do anything he had to to save Charlie's leg, the whole leg. That was when he and Mama found out about a doctor in Boston. If he couldn't help Charlie, then nobody could. Papa arranged for him to come to Johnstown and operate on Charlie's leg. Charlie ended up with a stiff knee, and he wore a shoe with a raised heel, but the doctor saved Charlie's whole leg. Charlie finally came home at the end of April. At night, he sat on the porch swing with me. He would point to the different constellations. Then I would count the stars in them. We could hear Mama humming inside, and we thought the worst was over. It wasn't. Everything started to change in May after Mrs. DeLuso saw the shooting star. I remember she didn't even knock. I had just mopped the parlor floor for Mama when Mrs. DeLuso came rushing through the front door. With one step onto the wet floor, that four-foot-high, four-foot-around woman was all arms and legs screeching wildly, Oh, ah, Mama Mia, as she slid across the room. One look from Mama and I bit the sides of my cheek to keep from laughing at Mrs. DeLuso, the human cannonball. I stayed in the room long enough to see her come to a crashing halt, sprawled across the small table where I had sorted my postcard collection. Later, Mama explained that Mrs. DeLuso had, been, had seen a star shooting across the sky above our neighborhood the night before. According to Mrs. DeLuso, there, who was very superstitious, it meant death or bad times for someone on Maple Avenue. There must have been a lot of shooting stars that night. That same week, Miss Penton, my teacher at Maple Avenue School, decided to fail the entire second grade. She insisted that there were students in our class who were not ready for third grade. 
If she failed one, she promised, she would fail everyone. And she did. My papa was the only parent who wasn't afraid of Miss Penton's sharp tongue and puckered lips. He walked me to school one morning after the announcement, then made me wait in the hallway while he spoke with her. I heard him introduce himself. I didn't hear a word from Miss Penton. Papa went on to explain that he and Mama felt certain that I was prepared to attend third grade next year. He told her that I could add, subtract, multiply, use a cash register, make change, and write orders at our family store. I knew Miss Penton was angry. I heard her tapping a ruler on her desk the way she always did when someone crossed her. Miss Pinton either ignored Papa's explanation or did not hear a word he said while she tapped away. She simply told Papa that we Italian immigrants were in America now and that our last name, Bandini, should be changed to Bandon. I couldn't hear what Papa said to Miss Pinton, but my full name, Margot Bandini, remained on my report card. Papa won one battle and Miss Pinton won the other. The entire class, including Rosa and me, repeated the second grade. That was four years ago in 1929. Everything, hasn't cha everything has changed on Maple Avenue. And to think I wasn't afraid. Not then. Chapter 2. Maple Avenue, 1933. Papa owned a shoe repair shop on Bedford Street. I often walked to, to work with him when there was no school. Every morning at 6 o'clock, he crossed over the First Street Bridge, stopped to greet Mr. Bob, who operated the train tower on the bridge, then walked the long trek past the steel mill. Papa stopped whistling and tipped his hat in respect as he passed St. John's Church. At the corner near the Swank building, he started to whistle again and continued until he reached the shop. As Papa unlocked the door, he would pause to breathe in the balmy scents of leather and shoe polish. Then he'd turn on the lights, walk behind the counter, and put on his apron. In the late afternoon, Papa closed the shop and walked past the bank on Main Street. There was a time when he would stop in the bank every Friday just before closing. That was when he carried a small stack of money, proof of a busy week. He would smile as he proudly handed the stack over to the teller behind the counter. Sometimes Mr. Lockhart, the bank president, would smile back and shake Papa's hand. Not anymore. Now Papa walked by the bank, jingling the small change in his pocket sometimes carrying a basket of fresh fruit and vegetables. Today I heard him tell Mama that Mr. Lockhart stood in the window of the bank yesterday. Papa tipped his hat, but Mr. Lockhart didn't seem to notice as he stared out at Main Street. He stopped shaking Papa's hand a long time ago when Papa stopped carrying the money sack. Now Papa used the pocket change to pay our food bill. Mr. Frappa, who owned a grocery store on Maple Avenue, kept a large black ledger of all the money people owed him. Every Friday, Papa handed me our account book and sent me across the street to Mr. Frappa's store. I knew we weren't poor. We had our house, a radio, and food. Rosa lived next door in her house. Her father was a steel worker. One family in our neighborhood had to move away one cold March day. It happened after the sheriff posted a sign on their front door, Sheriff Sale, in big black letters. They had to leave everything behind except for the suitcases. They carried the clothes they that carried the clothes they wore and their cat. I didn't tell Mama, but Rosa and I peeked into their basement window last week. It gave me the shivers to see their towels still hanging on the clothesline in the cat's, bo next, cat's box next to the stairs. Nobody knew where they went. Mrs. DeLuso visited Mama tonight. Her visit seemed to carry a cloud of icy gloom, even though it was the middle of April. Cold chills ran down my spine as she reminded Mama that Il Diablo, the devil had brought the depression to Maple Avenue the night she saw the shooting star. My fifth grade teacher, Miss Dobson, said the Great Depression started in October of 1929 when the stock market crashed, banks closed, and people lost their money and their jobs. She even told us about wealthy men who had jumped out of windows because they had lost everything they owned. Maple Avenue was snuggled between twin hillsides. There were no wealthy people or fancy houses in my neighborhood. Our house was painted brown and had three stories. My bedroom was directly above our front porch and had two huge windows that met in the corner. From the front window, I could see all of Maple Avenue, from the brickyard to the Acme Bakery. The side window looked out onto Rose's front porch, and beyond that, St. Anthony's Church. Tonight, I could hear the steady squeak of the front porch swing as it rocked Mama and Papa back and forth. They often sat there at night while they talked. Margo, time for bed called Mama. Good night, Mama and Papa. I would leave the windows open. 
the win- so I would leave the windows open. I didn't mind if the breeze came in so long as the dark stayed out. Chapter 3, Maple Avenue News. Little brothers can be such a nuisance, announced Rosa. I glanced back at Charlie and Rosa's younger brother, Michael. I heard that, Charlie yelled back. Well, then, hurry, I called over my shoulder. If the bell rings before you get to school, we'll all be staying after school on a Friday afternoon. The boys were walking a half block behind us. Charlie was showing Michael the gold pocket watch Papa had let him take to school today. I should remind you that Charlie is only one grade behind us, I told Rosa. I might remind you that as long as they're both wearing knickers and not long pants, they're still our little brothers, chided Rosa. Where did he get that watch anyway? Papa was given that watch after the Great War. It belonged to a friend of his, a soldier Papa knew in the Yankee Division of the United States Army. They were stationed in France together. Papa received his United States citizenship papers while he was on the battlefield in the war. His friend died on that same battlefield. I'm not certain which Charlie is more fascinated by, the story behind the watch or the watch itself. I glanced over at Rosa, who came to a dead halt and stood there shaking her head. Your father let Charlie take something that valuable to school? I had to admit, even I was surprised. Papa kept that watch in the drawer of the server with his medal and his citizenship papers. Charlie was allowed to look at it, but Papa had never allowed him to take it out of the house before today. Maybe Papa thinks Charlie's growing up, even if he is in knickers. Teasing Rosa was something I loved to do. She was always so serious. We made it to our seats as the bell rang. At lunchtime, I saw Charlie showing the watch to a group of boys from my class. I started to wonder what Charlie had told everybody about the pocket watch. He was surrounded by fifth grade girls at dismissal and didn't look the least bit shy about it. Catch me, I shouted as I tagged Rosa on the way home. It felt good to know the weekend was here. Mama must have agreed because Rosa and I sat and talked on my front porch until Papa came home for dinner. I didn't have to set the table or peel potatoes. Margo, take this to Mr. Frappa, please. Papa opened the screen door and handed me the account book. A dollar bill and some change. Call Charlie to dinner on your way home. Charlie, come to think of it, I hadn't seen him since we'd left school. He's probably at my house, answered Rosa. I'll send him along. I have to go home for dinner, too. I ran across the street to the grocery market. The bell on the door jingled as I walked in. Mr. Frappa was talking to Miss Deluso and another customer. I walked over to the candy counter to wait my turn. My mouth watered, just looking at the peanut butter kisses and roasted peanuts. Gypsies, I could hear Mrs. Deluso whisper. Near Grandview Cemetery. The wealthy. Steal food. The gypsies had come to Johnston before. Anything and everything that had been lost or stolen was blamed on their arrival. They were back, and so were the rumors. I put my nose up against the glass of the candy counter. I was sure that sweet smell was coming from the peanut butter kisses. Mr. Frappa's grocery store had one of the few telephones in the neighborhood, and a radio, too. He always seemed to get the news first, then shared it with anyone who was interested. Mrs. Deluso was always interested. She preferred to report her own version of the news to the neighborhood. Steal children, added the other customer. Mr. Frappa smiled at me. He knew better than to interrupt and open his ledger while Miss Deluso was there. I glanced up at the price board behind him. Pork chops, pound, 15 cents. Large eggplants, two for 15. U.S. number one potatoes, a bushel, 75 cents. Five pound sack pastry flour, nine cents. Iceberg lettuce head, five cents. Fancy sweet peppers, each, one cent. Coconut cupcakes, four for five cents. Peanut butter kisses, pound, 10 cents. Mmm, I could get a whole lot of peanut butter kisses for 10 cents. I tried to think of something else. It was getting harder to wait for Mr. Frappa. I walked back to the door and looked for Charlie. I sure hope he'd remember to return Papa's watch before he'd gone out to play. Excuse me, excuse me, Mrs. Deluso was standing behind me. I moved to, to let her and the other customers out the door. Ah, Margo, it's good to see you. Mr. Frappa was at my side. I handed Mr. Frappa the money and our account book. He walked to the back of the counter and opened the ledger to our name. The page was filled with numbers. He counted the money I gave him, wrote the amount in his book and ours, then subtracted. We still owed him $12.75. Thank your mama and papa for me, Margo. He closed the books. What news do you bring me today? I had to smile. The fun was about to begin. 
Miss Dobson's father owned the local newspaper. She'd bring the daily edition to school every morning and use the first ten minutes of geography class to discuss the news. Mr. Frappa and I enjoyed a good game of news tag at least once a week. Miss Dobson told us today that the drought in Oklahoma is so bad the topsoil blows away in the wind. I was proud of myself. Mr. Frappa had been a teacher somewhere near Pittsburgh. He'd returned to Johnstown to tend to the family store after his school was closed down because they couldn't pay the teachers. Did you know that entire families are leaving their Oklahoma farms and moving west to find work in California? They call them Okies, he told me. Mr. Frappa always got the last word in. Last year, he used the price board as a news board to keep track of Amelia Earhart's flight across the Atlantic to inform his customers that the New York Yankees had won the World Series and to let them know that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had beaten Herbert Hoover in the presidential election. Sometimes his store felt like a classroom. He always made the neighborhood children count their own change. He even gave me a postcard for my collection. It had a picture of the Empire State Building on it, the world's tallest building. Charlie was in today. He, Charlie, dinner, oh boy, I'm in trouble. I shouted a goodbye to Mr. Frappa as I ran out the door and headed home. Please, Charlie, be home. When I got back to the house, Mama and Papa were waiting for the dinner table, waiting at the dinner table. Come, Margo, dinner is getting cold. Charlie should be along soon, said Mama. I was relieved that they didn't ask me if I'd looked for him. It took him a little longer to get around, and he often arrived home just as we sat down to dinner. But Charlie had, a re had really done it this time. Mama never said a word all through dinner and kept glancing at the door. Papa asked me about my school day, but I could tell by the way he kept looking at Mama that he was wondering about Charlie, too. Margo, you wash the dishes and I'll clear the table, said Mama as we finished eating. I knew it was not the right time to share my thoughts about the unfairness of it all. Charlie had missed dinner, and now Mama was doing his job. I finished washing the dishes and turned to see Papa standing at the front door. Margo, where did you go look for Charlie? I remembered our account book in my pocket and handed it to him. Papa, I was talking to Mr. Frappa and didn't have time to look for Charlie. Maybe Rosa forgot to tell him to come home, too. The troubled look in Papa's eyes made me add, I'm sure he took very good care of your pocket watch, Papa. I opened the drawer to pull out the watch as proof. The watch wasn't there. I didn't even stop to close the drawer. Papa, I'll go find Charlie, I called. The screen door slammed shut behind me. Maybe Rosa was right. Little brothers and knickers were a nuisance. Charlie was in trouble for not returning the watch when he got home from school. And now I was in trouble for not finding him. Chapter 4. Charlie. Rosa's front door was closed. I knocked hard. No answer. I could hear shouting inside. That seemed to happen often at Rosa's house. I knocked harder. Rosa came to the front door, opened it wide enough to squeeze through, and close it behind her. She had been crying. Are you okay, Rosa? She looked at me and swallowed hard. The steel mill cut my father's work hours again. He's working one day a week now. My mother insists on taking in sewing and laundry. I could help, too, but my father won't let us. He believes it's a man's job to support his family, and that if my mother and I have to work, then he has failed us all. He wants us to move to Buffalo, New York. He heard there's work there for any man who wants it. Oh, Rosa, you wouldn't kid me, would you? We've been friends all our lives. I tried to keep my voice steady and to act grown up, but the thought of my best friend moving away made me feel like a li lost little kid. My father said he won't wait for the sheriff to post a sign on our door. He said we'll leave before anybody comes to force us out. We don't have the money to pay our mortgage. A loud crash from inside quieted both of us. Michael came running down the narrow sidewalk that led from their backyard. He suddenly looked much younger than nine. His beet red face was smudged with grime and streaks of tears. His voice cracked. I, I had to do something to stop the shouting. I won't move to Buffalo. Rosa looked through the window of the front door. Her mother was picking up the shattered pieces of a glass vase. Michael, I think you'd better stay with us for a while. We can sit on Margot's front porch. Rosa looked at me the same way she did when I had that rare licorice whip and was debating whether or not I should share it. I'm not so sure you want to do that, I said. I'm in just as much trouble as you are. Michael, if Charlie isn't with you, then where is he? He never came home from dinner, or for dinner. I haven't seen him since, uh, since after school. Mama had a way of knowing when I wasn't telling the truth. All she had to say was, Margo, your chin is growing. It worked every time. There was something in the way Michael rolled his big blue eyes and bit his lower lip that made me suspect he knew more than he was telling. But I couldn't wait any longer. If Papa didn't have the pocket watch back soon, Charlie and I would both be punished. Look, if you see Charlie, tell him he better get home fast with Papa's watch. 
Sorry, Margo. Rosa pulled Michael to her side. We come with you to look for Charlie, but... It's okay. Something deep inside me stirred. I remember what it was like to want to protect a little brother. I turned away just in time to see Mrs. Deluso walking up the steps of my front porch. For once, I was thankful for her timing. She would occupy Mama and Papa while I found my little brother. Charlie was an altar server at St. Andrew's Church and had become friendly with some of the boys who lived at the church's orphanage. I walked to the back of the orphanage where a group of boys were playing kickball. Charlie wasn't there and nobody had seen him all day. I ran to the coal heap. It was nothing more than a fenced-in piece of land where workmen poured the used coal ash from the brickyard ovens. Charlie often took a small tin bucket there to collect the chunks of coal left in the pile. Mama was so angry with him the first time he came home covered in black, she made him promise to deliver anything he found to the family with the cat. That was before the sheriff's sale sign went up and they were forced to leave their home. I wondered if Mama knew that. Since they'd moved, Charlie traded the coal chunks for pieces of candy at Frappa's. I swore that if Charlie didn't show up soon, I'd tell Mama that myself. A horn beeped outside a neighbor's house across the street. A group of kids deserted a game of dodgeball in the alley to examine the shiny black car. I crossed the street to see if Charlie was with them. One of the kids said he'd seen Charlie in Frappa's grocery store after school. That was all anybody knew. I turned and ran back down the street. The sun was setting when I got to Frappa's. The store was dark and the door was locked. I wished I had listened more closely when Mr. Frappa had mentioned he'd seen Charlie. I ran to the brickyard. The corner lot between the factory and the neighborhood houses supported an elevated train track. A tunnel under the tracks led from the lot into another open area. Rosa had seen the older boys smoking in there last week. I called through the tunnel. Charlie! Charlie! Charlie, you answer me right now! There was no answer. I couldn't help feeling that this was not good. My stomach flip-flopped as my mind raced back in time. The last time Charlie had missed dinner was the evening Mama and Papa rushed him to the hospital. I shook my head and tried to erase the terrible memory. I stomped my foot and let out a groan that echoed through the tunnel, then turned and looked up Maple Avenue one last time as I headed toward home. Everybody on Maple Avenue knew Charlie. He'd stop a game of kickball to help carry a neighbor's groceries, then turn around and get into mischief in the wink of an eye. Mr. Bob had to chase him off the arches to the bridge one day. Charlie and Michael had wanted to see who could climb the highest without getting caught. There was quite an uproar the day Charlie snuck a garter snake into school. The principal pulled me out of Miss Dobson's class and made me walk Charlie home. Here I was again. When Charlie got into mischief, I got into trouble. It was a good thing Charlie wasn't a twin. Lola Nola, a girl in my class, had too many brothers, including a set of twins. Everybody called them double and trouble. Lola came to school one time with a fat lip. She had been punished for not watching her younger brother. He was caught stealing apples from stealing? Stealing? I stopped dead in my tracks. Stealing? I said out loud. My mind raced back in time again to Mr. Frappa's store and to what I had heard. What had the customer said about the gypsies? Stealing children? Mrs. Deluso would know. And I knew where to find her.